Hello again, it's Mr. Pete, your YouTube shop teacher, and you are watching part four, the final part of my build on the little mayonnaise jar engine. I sincerely hope you watched the first three so you know what we're talking about here. And I left off in part three with making the uh, cylinder, and it's not done. I cut it the length, and I reamed it one-fourth inch. That's the bore for the engine. And we have a couple holes and just a little bit of milling to do, and this part will be done. Okay, the steel one here on the left is the original, and the magnesium one is on the right. And I've already laid these holes out, and there's a center line, so be sure and put that center line in there. And the top hole, large hole there, is 3 16 and it is 812 thousandths from the bottom. And 812 thousandths happens to be 13 16 of an inch. And the tiny 1 16 hole there is from the bottom again 546 thousandths which is an oddball dimension 35 64 one other thing i want you to note here is that on the original that 1 16th hole goes through one wall only it's not a through hole i'm going to drill it through both sides why and you could do it any way you want but i'm going to use that to transfer that hole onto the main column here rather than use dimensions and I recommend that method. Okay the work is mounted in the Bridgeport vise and I've already used the edge finder to locate the 16th inch hole so I'm on the center line and I'm in from the bore end what did I say 35 64 and now I will center drill or just a little peck mark on it. And now one sixteenth inch hole all the way through the workpiece. And now I'm moving the table here. Let me unlock it to eight hundred and twelve thousandths. I'm watching the digital readout, which you cannot see right there and I'm going to lock the table and I'm ready to center drill. And now one size under 3 16 all the way through. And now I can ream 3 16 One final operation here. This is just clearance on the cylinder to reduce friction I suppose and it's about 5 sixteenths from the end to this little shoulder here and only 25 thousandths deep. I've already set everything up and I'm ready to cut. No, I'm not done, but it looks kind of like I'm done. What I've done here is to do a pre-assembly using the piston from the other one and this little part right here, but at this point everything turns over freely. There's absolutely no binding and no tight spots. If there are tight spots, you've got to go back and find out what is the matter and redo it. So I'm not going to show you how to make this little bushing here, collar, I guess it's a collar. So it'll, it's to be made out of 7 16 steel or brass and in fact, the brass one I did not make. The steel one here I did. So it was a piece of this. It was faced, drilled and reamed 3 16 A tiny little 440 set screw drilled and tapped and installed. And uh, I tell you what, um, it's, it's, I'm not going to show you how to do it, but it, it is kind of awkward. And you want that little set screw in the middle and it should be about 155 thousandths thick or whatever you want to make it. And then let's talk about the spring. The spring is just about four or five loops 
and it has to have a 3 16 ID to fit onto that rod. And how thick is the wire? Around 20,000. So look through your spring collection and try to find a lightweight spring like that. And there's the piston and the rod, connecting rod. That's what we're going to tackle next. But what I wanted to say before we go any farther is that this shaft here has to be absolutely perpendicular to the column or you're going to have air leaks or it's not going to work at all. So that's one of the most important things. And that's why I did most of my drilling and reaming on the milling machine. You may not have a mill. So I want to take you through the making of this because this is really kind of tricky and difficult and very delicate. The shaft there where my thumb is, is about an eighth of inch long uh, diameter. I'm going to give you some other dimensions. Start with quarter inch brass, I suppose steel would do, and center drill one end. And then we got to take it over to the lathe and we're going to hold it in the three jaw right here and support it with a live center and turn down the shaft. So I've already done one step here, but we're going to do it over starting on this end. The overall length will be one inch. The length of the piston is about 222, 2, 2. I told you the diameter of the rod is one eighth, but it's 0.114, but I'm going to make mine one eighth. And the length from the end of the piston to the center of the crank hole is 7 eighths of an inch. So I think I've given you all the dimensions you need to know. And in the end, this is about a little bit over a quarter inch. So now you got all the dimensions. I have carefully and methodically laid out the key points on the quarter inch brass rod and I'm going over to the Atlas lathe and uh, let's check out the setup. Now in order to turn down the eighth inch portion here, the actual shaft, you will either need to grind yourself a tool that looks something like this. That's one that I had laying around here. It did not work real well so I resorted to another method here that you may consider a no-no but since this brass is so soft, I'm strictly going to use a cutoff tool. And I'm going to go back and forth with real light cuts. And it's going to work because I tried it already, although it probably is debatable as far as being proper etiquette. Okay, I'm ready to turn it down. And I've set stops on the extremities here. Can you hear it? I know you can't see them. <laughs> I'm about down to dimension. This should be the last pass. One more pass off camera. Well, that was a rather unorthodox setup to turn the shaft right here. And this is rather unorthodox as well. The work itself is being held in a one-fourth 5C collet in a collet block, and I had to support the other end with the Peterson Products vise just snugged up, and I'm going to proceed to mill this flat, and that'll be 60 thousandths down, and then I will rotate the work by 180 degrees and do it on the other side, and then probably drill that 330 seconds hole while I got it set up as well. Okay, I'm down to dimension, and I will flip this over and mill the other side. I won't show that. Now I'm going to drill this little 330 seconds hole. And that's what it looks like so far. Now I'm going to go over and mark 
the location of the hole, but absolutely do not cut this off to length until you are done with it because we need a handle. So we're, we're holding it by the collet here and I was holding the excess stock there by the center drill hole in the vise because it would surely flex, wouldn't it? Using an edge finder, I have found the middle center of the stock in the uh, Y direction here. And I've, uh, I've located where I want to drill the hole. Again, I'm drilling this tiny little 3 30 seconds hole. Actually, I'm going to ream it 30 seconds and I'm going to drill it one size under. And I've got a little center drill in there right now to give it a little peck. And I've got it supported the way I did before. So it should be good. Dull drill bit, drill bit, dull drill bit, I'm going to exchange. Brand new drill bit. Some of you may remember what I said about how quickly a drill bit will dull after it has cut steel. So this is a brand new one. It should dig right in. Boy, what a difference. Now to ream. Reaming may be overkill. Drilling probably would have done the job. Well, there it is. And you know what? I might as well saw it off while it's in the block. I won't show that, but I'll just take this over to the bench vise, hold it, and saw that off. And then I got to trim the other end as well. Very tedious, as I said before. Plan on making three of them before you have a good one. Well, I sawed off the excess here that has the center hole. And now off camera, I'm just going to take it to the belt sander here and touch it up a little bit and I'll come back. I still got something to hang on to. You see, this is still my handle. And then the very final thing I will do will be to saw it off here and then hold this in the three jaw and face the end of the piston. Okay, it's a pretty good facsimile of the original. I have rounded off the corners here just a little bit. Now I will saw right about where, well, the length of the piston is what I'll I'll do. Allow a little bit for cleanup, of course. And there's the finished connecting rod piston assembly, but all in one piece. By the way, if you don't want to make this all in one piece, go back and look at some of my other machine, my uh, other steam engine videos from a long, long time ago where I made a three-piece deal. All right, pretty good fit. Feels just a little rough. I'll probably polish this a little bit. The piston. Of course, I'm fitting it dry. Okay, I've made a temporary assembly. It's not done yet, but I just wanted to see if it turns freely, and it does. No tight spots. I made this little collar while you weren't looking. Simple job. Turns very freely. Now, one thing you need to watch here is that you have a little bit, that's a 12,000. You've got to have just a little bit of room there between the connecting rod and the crank disc. Also, just a little bit of end play, like this, so there's no binding or tight spots. It won't run if it's tight. It's just that simple. You might as well quit now or remake some parts if, if you are not successful with this turning. Now what do I need to do yet? Well, I have not drilled the, the little steam ports in the column. So we need two holes here and of course we need the exhaust and we need the intake. That's eighth inch tubing. Now why or how am I going to locate those? Whoever made this might have been taking dimensions off of a drawing. I really don't know, but remember they got some goof ups here. This is, this hole isn't in the center, but it doesn't seem to affect anything. But I'm going to use my time, time honored method of locating those two holes. And that's why I ran 
this hole all the way through both sides, whereas the original Where's that? Yeah, the original Okay, this is the original one and there is no hole like there is on mine. You can see that? So my hole has to be plugged and that is what this little wire is in is all about in my prototype. And I could cut that off or I could just leave it. No one will question, hey, what's that doing in there? Get that out of there. So because it's a very thin wall there, very, very thin. All right, now I'm going to show you how to transfer those holes. This is the most important. Well, everything's important, isn't it? So it is my intention of transferring this hole in two different positions. That'll give me two center punch marks on the main column. Now I could use transfer punches and I have a set of numbers, but when you get into the small sizes, they're just all bent up like paper clips. So I took a 1 16th inch drill bit and cut it off and put a point on it. And watch what I'm gonna do with it now. With the crank here at the nine o'clock position, I better zoom in, huh? So I'm at the nine o'clock position and there's a little point here, so I'll put that in the hole and pound the heck out of it. And I'm gonna rotate this to the three o'clock position and tap it as well. Now let's see if those marks showed up. Okay, there they are. Boy, they're close together, aren't they? And those will be drilled 16th inch and one on the right. There's several ways of doing this. It can be drilled all the way through and it is the exhaust. The other one will intersect with that 3 16th hole, which I will transfer this with a square bring that line right around onto the center line here and center punch it and that will be the three sixteenths no eighth inch that's eighth inch tubing not three sixteenths you follow what i'm doing okay those two holes look good drill those on the milling machine if you have one and i trans again the one on the right goes all the way through. That's the exhaust. Now, if you want the engine to rotate in the other direction, reverse these two. But the one on the left is a blind hole. You can see the bottom of it. And I have brought that dimension around and right on where X marks the spot. I'm going to drill and then ream one eighth. This is one eighth inch hobby tubing, a one inch piece of it. And I do not want that to go all the way through. In other words, the depth of that should be right about there, not, not like that. Or I can bring it in. What, I'll, what I will do is drill this deep, and it, it's going to block that little hole. And I'll go back and real quickly re-drill the hole on the left so it breaks into the brass tubing. Is that clear as mud at all? I'm ready to drill the eighth inch hole. I'm not gonna ream, drilling should do it. I located it with the wiggler and I already center drilled it. And I want that hole to be 180 thousandths deep. So I'm not going to feed with the quill. I'm bringing that down until it touches. I'm locking the quill lock and I will raise the table 180 thousandths with the crank. Let's do that. Okay, hopefully I didn't break into the other hole. Okay, this piece is looking real good. It's very easy to, to ruin it in these last few minutes. So don't work when you're tired. Matter of fact, I'm going to quit here presently for the day. But can you see that the left-hand hole breaks into the eighth-inch hole? So what I'm going to do now, actually I'll do it off camera. There's that piece of one-eighth-inch brass tubing. I will put some Loctite on it. I will tap it in until it bottoms out. And then when that cures tomorrow, I will go back in here and drill and that will break through one wall of that 
brass tube, I hope. And again, the other one goes all the way through. And one other thing that I did with Loctite, and then this needs to set for a while anyway, and that's why I'm quitting here. I've been working for five hours and I'm pretty tired and there's not a whole lot left to do, but I plugged this hole and that's simply some 1 16th inch wire. I don't know where I got it, but it fits perfect. And I did put uh, some Loctite on it. And I put a drill in there, the shank of a drill, when I tapped this in place so it wouldn't go in too deep and interfere with the piston. Okay, I got a little Loctite on there. And tomorrow, and I'll probably do it off camera, I will drill in there, as I just said, with the 1 16th bit, because you can see I have blocked that. Now the Loctite has to set, and this old man is tired. So I'll see you in the morning, and we'll finish this little beauty up. And this part four, I realize, is much, much longer than the others. Good night. Good morning. It's the next day, and I did several things before I turned the camera on. One, the hole was already plugged here, and I sanded that off so it is flush and smooth, and I cleaned up all sides and a little bit earlier I cleaned the layout die off of the, the rest of this and polished it up a little bit but the usual superficial cleanup of Peterson. So I'm going to assemble it now, the rest of it. Be sure and oil everything with your fine tip oiler. You want some oil in this area. Boy not much oil comes out. And we need to oil this. And I did oil the main shaft earlier. You can always add more oil at a later time. You know, that, that thing doesn't put out much oil, so I'm going to use... We want this thing to run as smooth and silently as a Singer sewing machine, don't we? There, that's tricky. That's tricky. And the spring. And then the little collar. Notice I've only got about as much spring as comes out to the end. You don't want too much or it will impose a load. Okay, this is the original that I purchased. Here's the magnesium engine. Looks about the same, doesn't it? Now, it absolutely has to turn freely like that. And I've said that I don't know how many times, but if you've got the slightest tight spot or binding or lack of uh, spinning freely, it will not run. I guarantee that it won't run. It will come, I'll give you a written guarantee. Because we're only gonna run this on, uh, what, four or five pounds of, of air pressure. You could hook it up to steam. Now let me say something else here that if you wanted the engine to run in the opposite direction, I've mentioned this before, you would put the inlet on this side, which puts the exhaust over on the right. Could we ever make two of these that we would only use one flywheel, but they would run together? That'd be kind of neat, wouldn't it? So one would have to run in one direction and one in the other if you were so inclined to do that. Hey, that'd be an awesome project, wouldn't it? I know some of you are going to say, well, if it's got a tight spot, I'll just run it in. With my electric drill and my lathe. Well, you can do that, but you might have to let it run for four or five years, and it still isn't going to work right because something is fundamentally wrong. And others would say, well, I'll take care of that. I'll just put some of this clover valve grinding compound into the tight spots and just run the heck of a, out of it. No, it'll seize up and you will ruin it. You have to go back and address the problem and fix that and it will be, probably be someplace in your alignment. Sorry about that. It sounds like I'm... And I know some of you are going to say, well, what's this little nick here? Well, yeah, this rolled off the bench shortly after I made it and put a ding on it. <laughs> that brass is really soft. 
and look at all the imperfections in the magnesium itself. Well, the reason for that is the original magnesium plate came from Anthony Liftgates, and it actually was a, a match plate, a foundry match plate. Sometimes they made the match plates out of aluminum or wood and even magnesium to reduce the weight, and that's why there's so many holes in here. But yet there's a million dings as well, and that's why you see those blemishes, but there's nothing we can do about that. The job is done, and I'm wondering if eventually this will have that ugly grayish patina on it. I'm sure it will, but who cares? I am not a brilliant man, but one of the most brilliant things that I did over 25 years ago was to make these two sets. This is my taps in the smaller sizes, a clearance drill, and the tap drill size. So it's always convenient, ready to go. And I did the same thing with all of my reamers, where the power reamers are on one side, or chucking reamers, and then on the other side, I can't turn it around, uh, my hand reamer. So there's a double row here. Just, just a wonderful deal. And remember Dave Pigeon gave this set to me also very similar to what I did here. So somebody, oh, nobody copied it. That would be a, a vain thing for me to say, but there is a company that makes these little sets like that, which is pretty awesome. Thanks, Dave, for that. But speaking of brilliant things, I did something also very stupid years ago, and that was to make this full set of uh, Allen wrenches with the standard sizes, which immediately get lost, the T-handle type, and the Bondus, but these tangle up so much, it's just, it's just a pain in the neck. I never use that. It's embarrassing. I know what you're thinking. Quit gabbing and see if this thing runs. Now, I haven't tried it yet, but I have confidence that it will run because these are so simple to make, but again, all of the warnings must be heated. So let me get the compressor moved over here and we'll we'll see if it runs. You know it will. Let's take bets. All right, ready to test run it here. Now, it really would help if I had a couple small holes drilled in the corners, maybe one here and, and one here, and fasten it onto a little wooden board or something because you can see what's happening here. All right, let me turn the, the air on here at about five pounds. I'm just throwing the valve. And of course, they aren't self-starting. And there it is on five pounds of pressure. Started the first time, did you notice that? And of course, the cylinder is oscillating or wobbling, hence the name. And you know, there's just an awful lot of vibration with these two. Fun to play with, a great deal of satisfaction when it first starts for you. Or you will shed tears if it doesn't. And then quit for a week. If it doesn't run, quit for a week and quit until you're done pouting and then come back and troubleshoot it. This is single acting, meaning just like a car engine, internal combustion engine, it, all of the, uh, the power is on the downstroke. I have made many double action over the years too. But, you know, I don't have any of those left to show you. You'll have to go back into the archive and look at my many, many other videos on that. But is, isn't that great? And the darn thing doesn't weigh it, almost anything because it's magnesium. Hope this doesn't get caught in a fire someday. It would burn up, wouldn't it? All right, that's enough running it. Let's uh, summarize things here, shall we? Now let me tell you what mayonnaise engine means. When I bought this thing at the auction, now the sun was beating down relentlessly on this that day, but when I opened it up, the tape was just as sticky as can be. This is new tape here, but it, and this is, this is my uh, prototype actually on here. But uh, I think the whole purpose of, uh, of the jar was that the man that built it made a little display case, kind of like a glass dome you might put over some of your pretties. Maybe your wife has some things displayed like that. And 
since it was a mayonnaise jar, actually it wasn't. It was a Clausen pickle jar, but I didn't want to call it the pickle engine. I wanted to call it the mayonnaise engine. <laughs> Pretty stupid, huh? But that's where I got the name, and that's how I bought the thing. And that's one of the reasons that I got it so cheap, as nobody identified it. In fact, when it sat in the sun, it was upside down like this, and it just looked like a jar. And so nobody noticed it. Nobody bid on it, except this old fool. Okay, here's all three of them. This is the original, made by the deceased man. This is my prototype. And this is the magnesium engine. Pretty nice looking trio, isn't it? I'd rather have the shaft stick out a little bit like this than make it flush, but that's personal preference. Pretty awesome. You know, these are real little. As I told you earlier, these are the smallest engines I've ever made. Because when you compare it with this relatively small engine, look at they're they're only as high as the flywheel, approximately. I wonder how much less the magnesium engine weighs than the steel ones. Well, no need to wonder. Let's weigh them. Who cares? Okay, let's weigh this. It's in grams. This is the steel prototype. And it weighs 132 grams. And the magnesium engine, 94 grams. Quite a difference. Okay, I hope you enjoyed the video. This is just about the end of it. And this entire four-part series was filmed or videotaped using my iPhone 13. And I had a little trouble with focusing. And I was using this new microphone here, which was quite expensive. I think it was $15. But in watching some of the videos and editing, I do not think the voice is very good. So let me know what you think. Now, there's going to be some extra credit here at the end. And there's going to be uh, some still pictures. So let me know if you liked the video. And if you did, give me a thumbs up and subscribe and all of that other good stuff to help support my channel. And I'll see you in the next video. And I hope to have a playlist made for these four so that you can watch all four parts. See you next time. Well, I didn't burn the house down yet. Let's try it with the bigger toy. Well, that's enough danger for today. It takes quite a bit of heat to get a magnesium fire going. But once it does, it's hard to put out, although the, the metal did go out when it went into the, the bucket, as you can see. But supposedly firemen were trained many years ago to deal with Volkswagen Beetle engine fires because when it got hot enough, it was pretty hard to put out. End of extra credit. Boy, is this shop a mess. After working for six or eight days on one project, it's going to take me a while to clean everything up. Every machine is messy. And what a luxury it is to have more than one lathe. The atlas is a mess. The drill presses are a mess. And I'm sure like, there's the compressor I used. I sure did like using this little table here for some of my work. And the Cameron drill press was invaluable in drilling those small holes. Although I did a lot of it on the bridge board here, which is the biggest mess of all. Clean up!
Put your tools away. Do you notice anything different about me? Yes, I've got new glasses. I would not have been able to make this tiny little thing without new glasses. Even though I'm really looking through one eye, the cataract is so bad in this eye that I can't see close up at all until I have my surgery next year, next decade. I may never have it done. If I'm still able to do this, maybe I don't really need scary surgery